So my name, my name is um, Michelle. I have a BA in environmental studies. I, I have taken um, master gardener courses in two counties. I am not a master, but I do like learning about plants. It's a hobby and it's a profession. Um, I'm a Sunday yard advisor and I've been a past landscaper and florist. Um, here at Sunday, one of my jobs is to troubleshoot you know, problems happening in the lawn. Of course, bare spots come up all the time. Um, so maybe you've tried patching a bare spot, um, but not having success, or maybe you have a bare spot now and you wanna know how to fix it. Hopefully I go over all of those things for you today. So real quick before we get started, one more time, um, this webinar will be recorded and made available in a follow-up email. Um, and please submit any questions to the Q&A box. A survey will populate at the end of the webinar. We look forward to your feedback. All right, jumping right in. So there are a number of things that can cause bare spots, shade, planting the wrong grass seed or sod, turf pest damage, compaction and foot traffic, abiotic injuries, and then at the end we'll discuss uh, repairing and what you'll need for that. Okay, so this quote I like, um, if you can't get grass to grow under your tree, it's time to accept the situation and plant shade tolerant perennials and ground cover. So this professional from LSU is not wrong. Um, it's a funny quote. It's a little bit of an extreme perspective, but the reason it's not wrong is because, let's take this picture for example. It is really shady under there. This is a large tree, so the canopy is heavy. It's very shady. The tree has big roots. Um, so those roots right underneath here, you know, there isn't gonna be a lot of dirt depth for our grass roots to get established. All this grass is sparse and thin. So what do we do about this? So there's a number of things we can do. As a landscaper, we like to mulch around the trees. That way the mulch looks really nice and tidy. We extend the grass out to the area where the sun can reach it. So I love that idea. He says plant um, shade tolerant perennials like hostas or ferns would look beautiful under this tree, doing something different with that landscaping. And what are our other options? If it's not so shady, but you're still having some problems, that might just be grass type. So most grasses need six hours of sunlight to look good, but some shade tolerant varieties can get by with four. So we have two charts here from Sunday. On the left is our warm season grass type. So if you live in the Southern United States, these are likely your grasses and your shade ones are St. Augustine and Zoysia. They do awesome in shade. Um, centipede can do a little bit. Bermuda does not like shade. So if you have a Bermuda lawn and you just can't get that grass to grow under that tree, that might be part of the problem. Um, cool season is up north usually. It's usually a Kentucky bluegrass, fescue, and rye. And these grasses generally do pretty well in shade, but we have one ultimate winner, our fine fescue. Um, and that just tends to do the best. Now at Sunday, we have a grass blend called Shade Select and it has cultivars of um, shade tolerant fine fescue, right? So um, they just do a lot better with a lot less sun. So those are some options, right? Get the right grass under the shade and maybe you'll have some more success. Okay, planting um, the wrong seed. I really wanted to include this in uh, my topic, because I see this a lot, and part of the reason is we go to the store and we pick up a bag and we're like, hey, I planted the grass, right? But we just might not be planting the right grass. And just like a garden, we want the right plant in the right place. And our first guide to knowing it, um, if we're planting the right grass is can it ex uh, survive extreme temperatures, uh, winter and summer? If we plant the wrong grass in the wrong climate, it will likely die off and result in bare patches. Um, we have a very rudimentary map to get started with. So this is a grass map. Um, so up here, up north, these are your cool season grasses, predominantly Kentucky bluegrass, fescue and rye. There are some 
other outliers in there. Down south are your warm season grasses, St. Augustine, Soisha, Centipede, Bermuda, Bahia, you name it, so many types. Um, and then this dark area is called the transitional zone, and this is where anything goes. Um, this area is not so cut and dry. It goes up wildly through California. It goes down through Texas, comes down into Georgia a little bit. Um, so this, this area can be a challenge. You can grow everything, but it's more of, is it all one uniform grass? Do we have multiple types of grass planted? If we have multiple types, are they, um, do they look better in the winter versus the summer? Is there patchiness? So that's sort of the problems I see encountered um, with that transitional zone. And then if you're in that area and you're starting a new lawn and you're like, well, what should I plant? I suggest you read, reach out to like your state university. So for example, this is from the University of California. I use this site all the time. I go in here and, and click on an area and I see, you know, the grasses that do the best for that area, water requirements, et cetera. Um, every state has it and they, they'll suggest, you know, what to plant and why to plant it. Um, let's see, did I miss anything here? Yes, so I put here planting annual ryegrass and I also put, oops, you've planted a cool season grass in a warm season location like fescue in Florida. It's not going to do very well. Um, it's going to die off or you planted Bermuda up north, might not handle the, the winter. So that will cause um, decline, obviously. But then there's this annual ryegrass, or anytime you see the word annual. So that means it completes its life cycle in one year. It's not going to return the following year. It, it's also called temporary turf grass um, or filler grass. So it has its place in the world. It's used for erosion control. It's used for um, lawns that are scalped. And if your lawn isn't scalped, then you don't need to pay attention, but it's used for scalping lawns and overseeding. It's used for um, quick green up by construction companies. This is not a Michelle approved turf grass. So <laughs> don't plant annual ryegrass. Um, it's not for you. Moving on. Turf pest injury. Okay, so these are grubs. I'm sure we've all heard of grubs, but um, turf pest injuries can cause major large bare spots in the lawn, really random, um, usually irregular patterns. A lot of times fungus is very similar to fungus is very similar to turf pest damage. So those things kind of look similar. Um, they grub is the larva stage of a Japanese or June beetle. So even when you're looking for pests, what, what stage are you going to find the pest? And, and could that make it more challenging to find them? And the answer is yes. Um, so we'll discuss this more. But if you see birds, raccoons, or skunks all of a sudden visiting your yard out of, out of nowhere, and you also have bear patches, they might be eating your grubs. <laughs> Um, so how can we test and make sure we know that we are dealing with the pest infestation, right? Um, few, few easy tests. Let's start with this resistance test first. That's simply, it's for grubs. You go out to the bare spot and you tug on the dead grass. Does it come right out? If it comes right out, grubs feed right on that root level. Um, where it meets the soil, you can see, um, pull back the grass a little bit. You can maybe even see the grubs. So if your grass is coming right out and you're seeing soil, um, that might be grub damage. Uh, soapy water test is probably, you know, a favorite way to detect pests. So you just take a gallon jug of water, add a tablespoon of dish soap, and you pour it over the, where the damaged area meets the grass, right? Because these animals, these pests are probably moving in to greener pastures. So you dump that whole thing over that area and then you see what floats up, right? The soap is gonna help float up any pests. 
And iodine pests is really important because we want to make sure to get the correct insecticide um, for the correct pest, right? Or we're not going to take care of the problem. So uh, last one is there's a chinch bug test and you can find this at getsunday.com and type in chinch bugs and you use a coffee can to kind of find them because they move. So they can be hard, hard to spot. Um, so definitely getting out there and investigating is kind of the the most crucial part of if you think you have uh, bare spots due to pests. And let's see. Yeah, just treating that, treating that bare spot with an insecticide um, and possibly the whole grass. And the main takeaway as well here is, is follow the instructions for whatever insecticide you're using, right? Um, they're all different. Okay, so hey, hey well, Michelle. Hey, sorry, my camera is going in and out, so I want to turn it off. But do you have a, a couple of good questions? Yeah, uh, we have a question from jo uh, Joanne asking: Does a grub infestation lead to a fungus, or could uh, potential stressors sort of have a compounding effect? Great question. Usually, it doesn't lead to a fungus. Fungus is caused by heat and moisture. But yeah, when when you're either experiencing a fungal disease or a grub disease, um, it's you know maybe it's a good time to look at your turf management. Just are we mowing at the correct height? Is the grass getting adequate moisture? Um, we can measure that and check on that. Um, and are we fertilizing correctly? Anything else? We did have, I, I'm sure I'll come back to a couple of these questions, which I missed, but we did have a couple of questions from camera in Missouri. And going back to the, the grass type here, um, your thoughts for Missouri, like you said, typically a pretty difficult area to, to maintain grass, right? So what are, depending on the area in Missouri, what are your thoughts? Cool season, warm season? How do we find that balance with uh, summer stress, especially? Yeah, Missouri is a tough one. and. Um... I have found that when I speak with our customers from Missouri, I usually want them to ask some neighbors what they're planting and also then reach out to um, and reach out to their state universities because of those cool, cool temperatures. I get a little concerned about warm season grasses, but some people have had some luck with some warm season grasses. So um, definitely takes a little digging, but I'm happy to dig more at that for you, and I can get you more information late, later. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, and so this I would say, I really appreciate those questions as well. I hope I answered those okay. Um, compaction and foot traffic are probably, I would say, the number one reason there's usually a bare spot, right? This is where I start. I immediately look, hey, you know, is the soil look a little hard? Do we use the grass a lot? And we should be able to use our grass, but at some point we've walked over it so much that we've caused some compaction or traffic. Uh, we use this photo. Um, one of the yard advisors has two pugs that like to run outside and take a quick turn to the fence. And so this slight damage in her lawn is due to the dogs using the same route. So it uh, can happen to anyone. And so another thing about compaction, it's um, just, it's just the soil particles packed a little tightly together. So I didn't explain that better. So here's, um, here's a photo from one of our customers. They're, they're using the lawn which I love. So a lot of times when I'm looking at these photos, time of year really depends on how we're going to go about fixing this. Right now in the heat of the summer, right, we might not have a lot of luck, you know, turning this around. Um, we can just reroute, right? Put some traffic cones out here. Let's start playing over here. Um, we can reroute and, and fertilize and, and hopefully help the grass kind of hang on over here. But in spring and fall, when we can see, that's really going to be the, our best option. So we would want to 
reroute, um, we would want to aerate in the spring or fall to loosen that compaction, allow our grass roots some room to move because when they compact, those roots have a harder time getting through the soil. So um, reroute, aerate, and then reseed this area. Um, so compaction just really, it's just kind of monitoring, do I, do I always take this path? Then maybe I need to do a little work on the soil. And grass itself is a, is a natural aerator. So getting that grass established will make it um, better to handle uh, all the compaction. If you have like a thick turf and some deep roots, it will be able to take kind of more walking on it. Um, over time. So reseeding and then not walking over that seed during that time, getting it established and fertilizing will really bring this area back. Um, we also have a uh, pet lawn grass seed. And so this is um, pet urine resistant. And so we see the dog in the photo and, and dog's urine can cause some bare spots as well. We'll talk more about that, but that might be a good grass blend. Uh, to put out for this one. Okay, so abiotic injury. Um, abiotic is a reaction um, from a non-biological organism. This is usually human interference. Uh, one way to prevent these damages is reading the labels of whatever you're using. And this image is of fertilizer scorch. Um, this was uh, certainly incorrectly applied. Um, can happen to any of us, or it was dropped. A lot of times we just drop fertilizer on the ground. We don't realize it can cause a big uh, area here. So one thing, Sunday takes the guesswork of, am I providing the correct nitrogen load per square footage at the correct time of year? That's one thing I absolutely love about our custom lawn plans is we take that guesswork and that math that are on the back of those fertilizer bags we take that guesswork away from you. And we do that by mapping your location and getting your square footage. And um, so that can help prevent this, but this can still happen if you just are fertilizing the garden, you might um, over proportion. So just follow those labels. Some other abiotic injuries. Um, so this area was uh, sprayed to prevent grassy weeds from growing in the area. So this was more on purpose, um, but more common herbicide injuries happen because we're not, I, we're not using the correct herbicide um, for the project sometimes. So we always wanna make sure, is it a selective herbicide, which usually means, hey, we're gonna tackle this weed in the lawn, but it's not gonna hurt the grass you know, great and safe, easy to use in the lawn. A non-selective herbicide kills on contact. It can be an organic product. It will still kill on contact. And so just making sure you're getting uh, the correct herbicide for the job, right? And to patch this area, we have a bear repair product. So that's um, seed, mulch, and fertilizer. And that will just help us reestablish grass in this area um, once we sort of rake away this material. More images of fertilizer burn, just another example of making sure however you're applying it, um, you're using, you know, it's coming out evenly. If it's a granular product, is, is, your, is your walking spreader working well and coming out evenly at a, at a good distribution and we're not creating um, some lines like this. And then honorable mention, um, pet urine. We can argue over if this is abiotic or not, We'll do that at a different time, but um, pet urine damage, um, it, pet urine contains lactic acid and urea, so it can, it can kill grasses, and they're, you can usually spot them because they're yellow in the center, they're dark green around the edge. This is a new one, but over time, they become bare spots, absolutely, and they can be seen all over the yard, and so Sunday has this great product called Pet Patch. Um, Essentially, just like our fertilizers, attach it to a hose. You can use it preventatively, just spray it out over the whole lawn, and that will help um, take that urea and help it filter through the soil a little better with using a surfactant. You can also use it if you see those spots, go out and give those spots a healthy 
um, drenching of pet patch, and that will help uh, help the grasses not dissolve away from that um, lactic acid. Any questions before I keep getting ahead of myself? We do, Michelle, really <laughs> good timing. So we have a couple <laughs> of questions regarding pet spots specifically. So one from Lewis asking, how can we tell the difference between uh, patch of grass, which has been impacted by dog urine, right? Versus um, a turf grass pest or a fungus? Yeah, great question. So how I tell is if I have a dog, I'm gonna start with the easiest possible answer. And I'll probably be using that pet patch preventatively. Um, as far as fungus goes, you can take those grass blades of any um, right near that damaged area where the grass blades go from brown to green. Take a look at a few of those up close. Do you see spotting marks all over the grass blades? You might have a fungus. Um, so that is how we detect fungus here. And then um, some other signs of fungus would be sort of the webbing kind of looks like mold on them or some um, white spots on them. And then let's see, pest. Pests we don't know until we do the drench test, right? So pouring that soapy water over it. Did I miss anything, Will? No, no, that all sounds good. I agree with everything you said, Michelle. <laughs> okay, good. I got Will's approval. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And we did have just one other clarifying question too from Christine asking um, female dogs, they can wreak havoc with their, their dog urine, right? <clears throat> yeah, so they they squat a little lower usually, so their urine's more concentrated. And so that that is true. Um, uh, just the, the manner in which they use the bathroom can be a little more. So using pet re resistant grass seed, using the pet patch, and even just water if you don't have pet patch available and you see them go pee, just, just try and dilute it with some water. Appreciate it, thanks. Thank you. Okay, repairing, the important stuff, right? So how do we repair the spots? And I just have, you know, disclaimer here. Um, usually most 80% of plant problems are soil related. Um, with grass, I don't know how much of that applies to grass and grass is a plant, but Soil is certainly a major factor. If you just can't get something to grow, I'm usually going to go and, and fix that soil. And so I'll let you know how I do that. Um, so these are the tools I use. A metal hard rake is great. So I scratch up the surface of any compacted soil. I go a few inches down, just kind of loosen it. Now, the bad thing about loosening soil is you are disrupting it a little bit. So you could have some weed seeds show up, but you're not gonna, you're gonna have better success by loosening that soil up. And especially if you integrate just some great topsoil in with it, um, really add that food for the plant, um, that soft environment for the seed. Um, so that's what I use for big areas. And then I use this little handheld weeder. I use those three prongs for some little small spots. I just wanna make sure that that soil isn't too hard, right? We wanna think of that little grass seed germinating. It's gotta get its roots. It's gotta work through all that hard soil, right? We wanna make that as easy as possible for it. So let's start with fixing lawns for cool season grasses, right? So that's the northern half of the United States, predominantly Kentucky bluegrass, fescue, and rye. You guys have it easy, just seed. Um, <laughs> and, and, and seed. So what I mean by that is cool season grasses spread at such a slow rate, waiting for them to spread on their own it is just truly a waste of time, in my opinion. I, I think you're just more, it's more worth it to just get some grass seed and get it out there and, and keep trying. Um, so spring and fall are the times you're gonna wanna seed. Kentucky bluegrass does spread. It usually is gonna spread right into your garden bed because it likes that soil there. But when it comes to bare spots in the lawn, there's a reason that grass isn't growing there. Let's just get some new grass seed. Let's amend the soil. And, and, and try and get that established. 
Um, and just remember with seeding, a lot of times people just say like, oh, I throw the seed out and I walk away. Um, in my opinion, that's not the way to do it, right? Uh, I suggest actually monitoring it every day, going out, looking at your seed. Is the soil damp? If the soil isn't damp, water it. We need, we need a warm, moist environment for those seeds to germinate. And then that time takes usually one to three weeks. And so um, any kind of time where the grass seed has had a time to dry out or it's too hot, like you're seeding in the summer, which is not the best time for seeding because it can dry out, there can be heat stress, um, then, then you've wasted your seed sort of. So to me, to get the return on investment is to seed, but maybe just invest a little time in getting some topsoil down before you seed. Monitor the seed every day. Just check on it. Make sure it's moist. You can actually overwater seed. And so you don't want to do that. It's very Goldilocks, but just making sure that soil is moist and that that moisture can last throughout the day. You'll have luck with seed germination if you do these practices. Now, warm season grasses, if you live down south, right? So Bermuda, you can seed. Bermuda produces viable seed. So we're lucky there. However, um, St. Augustine and Soisha, they typically have to be sodded or plugged, right? So you have to purchase these and that can also get costly. So just um, keep in mind, I would definitely work on the soil prior in the exact same way. Um, I would maybe try to plant some runners or some um, plugs first and fertilize and see if I can get them to spread. Um, these are fast spreaders, so fertilizing should help them spread. And if they have a habitable environment, they should eventually spread um, pretty well. And so uh, you shouldn't have to always replace, you know, with a full strip of sod um, all the time. You can encourage them with some soil work and, and fertilizing to get them to move. But at some point, if the spot is large enough, you'll probably have to resod. Um, but then once that sod is planted, again, very good spreaders, southern grasses. So we can encourage them um, to keep going with proper lawn maintenance and fertilizing. Okay, thank you so much. Um, please let me know how I did and respond to our survey. And please come join me in August for uh, talking about yellowing spots. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you again. Take care. Hey, Michelle, great, oh. great timing. But <laughs> we do have a good number of questions to run through. I was slacking okay. with uh, interrupting. <laughs> so let's no, that's see. Great. Um, Returning to some of the grass questions. So we had a question from Lauren asking, how has climate change impacted the recommended grasses? So has, especially in that transition zone, right? Has it changed a bit in terms of which grass you could grow there? Yeah, it has. And um, one perfect example is Denver, Colorado has been looking at planting Bermuda grass. Denver, Colorado that gets very cold in the winter um, is considering Bermuda grass for some areas. So climate change is changing that transition zone a lot. Um, again, investigating um, prior to making that decision yourself, um, reaching out to your local master gardener or extension office is another name for master gardener, but every county should have one. Reaching out to them, is this a good idea to plant? What's your suggestion? Um, they're typically a free service and they'll get back to you about uh, any any drastic change like that? Good question. And just to note as well, we realize we're running over time here. Truly appreciate you all being here. Like we said, we'll make sure to send the recording out uh, if you're unable to stay. But really great questions here that we have to to answer. Um, so all right, so Michelle, we have Ryan from Central Oklahoma. Uh, warm season grass, but shaded areas. Um, on the south facing side of the home and fencing where the Bermuda is dying, would a shaded shade grass be better? So maybe like that shade select or would edging it and in considering other uh, forms of ground cover be a better option? Okay, we'll chime in if you disagree with me. So 
If I already had a warm season grass established like Bermuda, I may consider planting something like zoysia just in the shade spots because those grass blades are somewhat similar looking. I wouldn't go with St. Augustine because that is a really wide blade. Um, and the reason I would stick with warm season grasses is because warm season grasses, you'll have that more uniform look where in the summer, it's all going to look green and it's going to look great. However, in the winter, warm season grasses go brown. So if you use some cold season, cool season fescue grasses, you're gonna have some patching of green mixed throughout uh, your kind of brown Bermuda. And then in the hot summertime, your fescue might go yellow and your Bermuda looks dark green. So I usually like to sti stick with the types. Um, Will, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I agree, right? And I, I think that's always the toss-up since the fest, like a cool season would tend to do a bit better than the more shade tolerant warm season grasses, right? But just like you said, we're then going to have different times of year where we're prioritizing the grasses appearance, right? Like um, the cooler months for the cool season, warmer months for the warm season. So I agree, trying to stick with warm season like a zoysia would be, would be ideal. Yeah, really good question. All right. Michelle, you've opened the <laughs> you've opened the floodgates. Let me start. All right. Let's see. Right um, <laughs> all right. We have a question from Mark. He had a large tree removed from the yard. He used several yards of dirt to fill the hole and level the ground area. Now he has lots of weeds. Um, crabgrass, bluegrass, plantain. What do you recommend? Oh yeah, that happens all the time. So first of all, we've we've filled the hole. Um, Hopefully we've mixed some good soil in there, not just topsoil, right? Topsoil is a great sort of um, bulky filler, but maybe some composted soil would be good as well because that, that contains a little microorganisms in the soil that make our soil alive and healthy. Um, so let's start there. Um, we've disrupted the area and we have just bare um, dirt. So weeds are always going to be there. Right, um, until we can fill that in with some turf grass or something more desirable, I think you will continue to see weeds. Um, I suggest seeding in the fall with grass seed and to make sure that grass gets established, just seed heavy and also make sure to maybe add some composted soil to make sure that we've given a really good uh, soil environment underneath. Any thoughts, Will? Yeah, no, sounds great. Let's see. Um, Malcolm from Virginia, great question. Northern zone of Virginia, wondering whether Bermuda grass overseeding would be a good option in a very sunny area around the pool, which is only used in the warmer months. So Michelle, it's probably going back to the previous question, right? Just trying to make sure that we're matching whatever we have established for the rest of the lawn, right? Exactly. Yep, sounds great. Right. And Robert, I truly apologize for the delay here. Uh, you had a question. How can you get rid of moss easily um, in the lawn? OK, great. So mo moss is really easily scraped away. It, it doesn't have a good root system. That's why we see it on concrete. Um, we have a product for that, of course. Our dandelion doom herbicide will take moss away. Um, you can also do some things with the soil's pH to make um, moss less habitable, but overall you'll want to see, is the moss showing up in a shady wet environment? Um, if so, can we reduce the watering in that area? Uh, usually shaded areas, can we can reduce watering by almost half. And so that might be an easier fix um, than constantly treating moss. Right. And question from Matthew. Do we recommend amending compacted soil with compost or topsoil to help replace the clay soil or bad soil? Bad soil or better soil? Oh, man, Matthew, you're stealing the words from us. But <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I have to say here, I don't love tilling. Um, and you didn't mention tilling, but I just want to mention that prior to any soil work. I prefer to use that metal hard rake, keep the existing soil that I have, but integrate some good soil as well. Keeping your um, local soil is really important. Um, it's really good for stru structurally 
And um, we don't want to further compact soil by kind of mixing it all together like a cake, right? Um, so if you have some bad soil, usually what that means is we just don't have enough desirable um, species there that we want to grow. So maybe you're having a lot of weeds and not a lot of grass. Let's, let's tackle the weeds this summer. Um, let's integrate some good soil into the top few inches of that soil and then reseed heavy this fall. Let's seed again in the spring and try and get grass established instead of weeds. All right, a uh, question from Thad. Uh, <laughs> is there ever a situation where we recommend burning the entire lawn? <laughs> so thoughts there, Michelle, in terms of uh, so many weeds that we just want to start from scratch. Yeah, I think there are some situations. Um, and I think how you choose to burn it is, um, it, it just takes a little investigating, but I think there are some situations where we, we do start all the way over. Um, so using, so we have a non-selective herbicide here at Sunday called Weed Warrior. It's or, um, an organic herbicidal soap. So it will kill grasses as well. But what it's great for is it's usually used like in rock beds where weeds just keep po poking up. You can kind of, it will kill on contact. That's a product you can use to kind of spray a big patch of area. Everything kind of dies off, the, the leaf portions mainly. And then you can go and once that's dried, kind of rake it all up. Um, do any soil work that you'd like, integrate some good soil and then reseed heavy. You're, you're always going to have weeds until you can get that thick canopy of turf established. Weeds will almost always still be there. Um, it's called a seed bank, right? So every outdoor soil is collecting seeds and the weed seeds are just waiting till the, the right time to germinate. Some sunlight, some moisture, and then all of a sudden they're everywhere. So actually, if you go see like a really nice, beautiful lawn that's super thick, you're like, wow, how do they have no weeds? Well, that's part of the reason they've got that great turf established. Um, actually burning of the lawn um, has been done and just investigate, maybe reach out to your um, local master gardeners or to us for more information. Um, definitely find, you know, good sources uh, uh, prior to doing that. But yeah, starting over is something um, I've certainly done as a landscaper many times. Um, if, if there isn't enough stand of desirable things that I like, I will uh, kill it off and, and I'll keep that soil there. But I just, uh, my expectation is really to work on that seasonally, right? So do a heavy seeding, but do it again in the spring, maybe do it one more time in the fall. And that's how you're really gonna see results. All right, let's see, Michelle. Okay, what if, so a question from Aaron, great question. What if the reason for the bear spot is none of the above or the factors mentioned today? So for the past four years, the area's been fine, right? And then recently there was something where it seems like it's been introduced, right? And now the grass is, is bare. What are your thoughts, Michelle? Send us photos. Um, yeah, so send us photos. We'll take a look at it. Um, that maybe sounds like it could a be abiotic and um, somehow, somewhere, something interacted and, and nothing's growing anymore. Um, some things I would do there uh, is definitely um, do some soil work, or you can even do a, contam a contamination soil test and see if something like that happened. Um, but yeah, we'd be more than happy to take a look. Yeah, I completely agree with Mich what Michelle said there. It seems like something, um, like you said, abiotic could be, if it's not along the lines of a pest or uh, um, fungus, right? It seems like it could have just been more of a, a unique factor, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, ooh, camera, great question again. So can we mix a, a blend of cool season grasses? So 
Michelle, mix cool season, mix warm season. Can we mix both? <laughs> or, <laughs> is it good to mix different cool season grasses together? And is it good to mix different warm season grasses together? It is a great idea to mix cool season grasses. They are often, oftentimes mixed already in seed blends. Um, that is because you can see a more uniform look throughout spring, summer, and fall, right? If you've got the rye performing, you know, great in the spring, that Kentucky bluegrass coming out, but you've got your savior fescue getting you through the hot summer months. If that's all mixed in there, you're gonna have a more uniform green look. We do want competition when it comes to cool season grasses. Warm season grasses, it doesn't really matter if they're mixed, but again, the texture and color vary so much on those grasses that I don't suggest mixing them. Um, some people will say, man, I have centipede grass and my grass is just never dark green. Well, a lot of centipede is a lime green color. And so you maybe wouldn't want um, centipede mixed in with your Bermuda or anything like that. So I, I tend to stick to one grass type when it comes to the southern grasses. And I realize we're now coming up on almost 15 minutes over. So we are going to try to wrap up here shortly. Uh, just want to highlight that for any questions which we do not address uh, here in the next minute or so, we are hosting a webinar next week uh, titled Ask Us Anything. So that will be a great <laughs> time. We'll be extending that to an hour. So please feel free to bring those questions then. We'll do our best to, to get through those as well. Let's see. Michelle, let's see if we have maybe time for... One more so. Uh, All right, let's tackle a couple here. So we had a couple of questions about grass seed and then um, whether to top dress or cover the seeds and then uh, okay. what to do about birds. So what are your thoughts there? <clears throat> yeah, so with seeding, um, I like to prep the soil, put the seed on top, and lightly dust soil over the top so to camouflage it from birds. Um, grass seed does not like to be planted deep at all. It really likes to be more near the surface. If you cover it, it should only be covered up to a quarter inch. Wonderful. Well, like I said, I truly appreciate everybody uh, staying here <laughs> late. We are going to get this wrapped up. We'll be sending the recording and the email tomorrow. Please feel free to bring uh, your questions to the AMA webinar next week, and we hope to see you there. But Michelle, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Will, for taking the Q&As, and we really appreciate everyone being here. Take care. Happy gardening. Bye.